All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, King's Church. Good to see you guys. Uh, it is such a joy and a privilege to be with you here this morning. And, uh, and I just have to say, like, the joy I see here, the faith I see here, it's just inspiring. Like, King's Church, you guys, you guys are just going for it. I, there's a very real sense of, like, joyful kingdom purpose here in you guys. And, and I just want you to know that every time I come, I get inspired, I get stirred up, uh, and I'm just so, so uh, strengthened by you guys every time. And then just relationally, I love getting to meet new people. I know many of you here, and uh, it's just a joy to deepen those relationships, uh, build new relationships, and, uh, and even just deepen our friendship with Dylan and Rebecca. And, uh, and I just have to say, like, Dylan is uh, just such a, such a great help uh, to me, a friend to me, a leader in my life now. It's amazing uh, how God has just, I mean, such great support. And uh, there's this great one anothering. And you guys are so blessed to have Dylan. You guys are so blessed to have Rebecca uh, here. You're so blessed. There's so many great leaders here uh, at King's Church. And, uh, and I just want you guys to know how blessed you are and what a blessing you are to us and to the entire Confluence family. So keep going uh, with that. So like Dylan said, I love the word of God. When I first got saved, uh, what happened was actually I was a, uh, I was like, a, I would call myself like a secular, like an elitist secular humanist. Like I thought stupid people were the problem with the world, smart people were the solution to the world, and religious people were a huge problem in the world. That's what I thought. And, and I, what happened was somebody invited me to church. And, uh, and when I came to church, uh, all of a sudden, I was like, this is really weird. I was like really drawn in. I met this group of Christians that was this community of God. And they took their faith more seriously than anyone I had ever met. And they were the best people I had ever met. Like before that, I had met Christians who were sort of like cold and distant or really self-righteous, which it turns out Jesus hated that as well. Uh, and so like to be pushed back by that is, is a pretty normal thing. But it was greatly challenging when I encountered a community of God's people who took their faith more seriously than anyone else I'd ever met, and they were the best people I had ever been around. That was massively convicting to my heart. And there was joy as they worshiped. And actually, what was funny is I remember when I came to the church for the first time, and people are lifting their hands and worshiping, there was this evil in me that was like, they think they're better than me. The truth is, they weren't thinking about me at all. They're worshiping God. They're not thinking, I'm going to make that new guest over there that's probably an elitist secular humanist. I'm going to make him feel real dumb. You know? They're not thinking that. They don't even know me, right? And I remember I came into church all like, I was like dressed up. I had like a belt. You know, my shirt was tucked in. It had buttons on it, you know? And I was like, this is what you do at church, right? And, and I'm seeing these people free. And I'm seeing these people enjoying God. And I was greatly impacted by this community of God. And at the same time, um, at the same time, while I'm there, I start coming a few weeks and there was this like weird, I was like, there's this like voice talking to me and I couldn't figure it out. And when I was in church, it was like extra loud and extra obvious. And it was like, like the word would get preached. I'm like, it's so clear all of a sudden in this moment. I'm like, what is this? We call him the Holy Spirit. And suddenly I had this desire in my heart. I'm, I kid you not, this is so crazy. I had this desire in my heart and it was saying, read the Bible start in the New Testament. And I was like, well, that's a good idea. You know, <laughs> I had faith for it, right? So I start reading the Bible. I start in the New Testament. I was, I was still not a believer. I was pretty confident in my intelligence. I was getting a degree in biochemistry and molecular biology, which at the time I would just mention a lot to intimidate people, right? Because it's not an easy degree to get. I graduated early. I want you to know that. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and I was trying to do it in three years. I ended up doing it in three and a half years, but uh, still, that's still early. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I start reading the Bible. And I valued intelligence. And, and as I'm reading, I remember Matthew, Mark, and I, was, I, I get through Matthew, and I'm like, that was cool. I was like, that, that's the story of Jesus. And then I read Mark, and I'm like, I just read this. And then I read Luke, and I'm like, this is really familiar. And then I, and then I read John, and I'm like, a little different, but basically the same, right? And, and I, here's what's crazy is I read that, and I was like, for someone who worships intelligence, as I got through those four books, I, it, I felt so ashamed. I was like, I've written off Christianity. I've written off Christians. And my worldview was being wrecked by this community of God, of radical love and radical community. And, and, and my, my worldview is being wrecked. Like, I, I'm like, I've written this off, and I didn't even know this simple fact about the Bible. Like, I think I know everything, and I didn't even know that, that like, the first four books of the New Testament are the story of Jesus told over and over and over and over again. And while my heart was being convicted, right, I was being humbled by God. I'm being presented with the wonderful person and nature and character of Jesus who is calling me, come to me, all who labor 
and are burdened, and I will give you rest for your soul. And I needed rest for my soul. And, and I was just so deeply touched by the time I started getting to Acts, and I'm like, this is cool. Like, I could do church like this, right? Except for the parts where they're, like, dying and getting, like, Stephen's getting stoned. I'm like, that's, you know, but his boldness at the end, he's like, you always resist the Holy Spirit, and they're holding rocks. He says that to them, and you're like, bro, like, if I could be that bold. So I hang out with youth a lot, so I've accidentally added bro to my lexicon. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, you know, anyway. Uh, but, but, like, and then I get to Romans, and I get to Rome, the, Romans 11, and Paul just does this de- great declaration about the sovereignty of God, and I, it hit me. I was like, God, you're God, and I'm not. And, and the word of God, I got saved reading the word of God. And so uh, I, I put great faith in the word of God. I love and adore the word of God. Today, we're going to go deep in the word of God. Uh, I like to start with some testimony and some story as often as I can. But really, the, the theme of our, of our passage today, uh, it, it, is, it is very in line with the story I've told you. Uh, the title of my, my, my message this morning is Radical Leadership, Radical Community. And, and you might be like, man, that word radical can be a loaded word. Like, what does this mean? Radical, right? In our world today, you say radical. If you're a radical Christian, people are like, oh, I don't know about, about this guy, right? Like, what does that mean, right? Uh, and, and ultimately, here's the thing. As I'm, I'm in the business of, like, redeeming things. And, and I believe there's a radical way of being a Christian that we have got to redeem. And, and it's so important. It's grounded in two things, okay? Uh, it, it is grounded, first and foremost, in the person and work of Jesus, what was he if not extremely radical? What, what, right, you read, go home and read the Sermon on the Mount. If it's been a while since you've read it, you've never read it. It's Matthew 5 through 7. Read it, and it will radically undo you in every way. It will challenge your gentleness. It will challenge your sacrifice. It will challenge your love in a way no one else in the world will. It will challenge your strength and your commitment to integrity and truth like no one else in the entire world will. It will challenge the call to holiness and righteousness and purpose like no one else in the world will do. Jesus was so radical. And so when I say radical leadership and radical community, I'm talking about knowing a radical Jesus, right? A Jesus of radical love, a Jesus of radical truth, a Jesus of radical strength, right? And so in this passage, we're going to see how the radical nature of Christ leads to a radical sort of leadership in the church that we should all aspire to and a radical kind of community. That for people who really take Jesus seriously, we should be incredibly radically loving and incredibly uh, like radically in purpose moving. And you guys, I'll tell you this, I see this in you. I see this radical sense of kingdom purpose here at King's. And I want to, here's the thing, what I love to do at churches, I love to throw fuel on fire, right? That's what I'm here to do today is throw fuel on the fire. And I want to cast a vision for you using uh, 1 Thessalonians. Really, uh, this passage, I want to cast a vision for you uh, for what is, hey, this is the kind of leadership we, we, we want to follow and get behind and support and strengthen, and we want to aspire to. And you're going to see that, that, that leadership isn't about like leaders up here, uh, right, in a community down here. No, no, no. Biblical leadership is incarnational. It's about leaders coming and being apart, dwelling among one another. Life Together, And you're going to see that in 1 Thessalonians. So uh, we're going to see a very cool picture of radical leadership and radical community. And when we get these things right, we have a radical impact. I don't know if you know this, but there is a loneliness epidemic in our world today. Communities are breaking down. The the, the opportunities to make friends and find real purpose uh, are getting smaller and smaller in our world. You know, online social media communities and Zoom calls, you know, are replacing in-person real-life relationships in a way that they really can't replace them, right? You guys remember when we, we were all, we all went to Zoom calls for that season? It was so depressing, right? Right? A Zoom call is better than a phone call, but when you can't meet in person, it is not a replacement for person-to-person interaction, right? And our world is growing in this sort of, like, community kind of crisis, and we have this wonderful opportunity this wonderful opportunity. This is such a missional opportunity for you guys in this city uh, to go for it as a radical community, welcoming people in and showing them a different kind of love and life that's centered on the radical love of Jesus. So let's stand for the reading of the word of God. I'm going to read sec- or, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 16, and then I'm going to pray. That's what it says. For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. 
For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have, admi- uh, that we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers and sisters, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his, king, his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Jesus Christ that are in Judea. Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but the wrath, or but wrath has come upon them at last. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would do wonderful and powerful work deep in our souls. Father, that you would move, that, Lord, you would stir up fresh fire in this church. Lord, I pray that you would call people to yourself this morning, that this transformation, this being born again, coming to faith in Christ, Lord, this is a miraculous work that you do, and I pray you do it here at King's Church this morning. I pray you do it at every church in this city that's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, wake up new believers to your kingdom. And Father, I pray that we would see the radical love of Christ more deeply today, and that, Lord, it would stir us to be a people like Christ, of radical love and radical strength, loving one another. God, that you would raise up leaders here, Lord, who are like Christ, who go to dwell among the people, Lord, who who aren't lifted up and trying to get separate, but rather are laying their lives down, sacrificing and serving in the the likeness of Christ. Father, I pray, strengthen this church and help us to see. And Lord, I pray that, that the way we love one another, the way we do community, the way we do leadership, Lord, this would draw hearts in. And I pray that that there's many who are lost and broken in this community that, Lord, aren't here yet. And I pray, put a fire in this church to go and draw them in. Lord, build up a community that draws them in. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless all of this in your name. Father, I pray let, let you, I pray you would leave a deposit through the word preached today yes, and uh, that you would be glorified as we look at your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. My encouragement to you would be this, would be to, you know, read, just get into the word of God. Like, read this passage. All right, I'm going to walk us through it. We're really going to dive in deep. We're going to reference a couple other passages here and there. But my encouragement to you would be like, get in the word and seek it and say, Lord, speak to me. All right, Uh, regularly, routinely read the Bible. If you've never read the Sermon on the Mount, get in it and read it. And and really my goal today is to help bring out the life that's here. I believe the Bible is sufficient. Uh, The Bible is potent and powerful. I believe the Bible preaches the Bible, right? Because it turns out it's actually not one book. Uh, It's 66 books compiled together, right? Uh, It's multiple witnesses, dozens of witnesses, right, together uh, talking about who God is and what he's done. And God's given us the word as his word, to speak to us and to build us up. And as you dive into it, God does that. So uh, that would be like a good action plan for you. Just get in this and read it. Read the book of Thessalonians and ask God, what are you saying to me? What do you have for me? All right, so Paul opens up here, and, and, uh, and here's what he says. He's, you might notice this a lot. He opens up in the, in the first verse here, and he says, For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we already suffered 
and had been shamefully treated at Philippi. As you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So Paul is describing something very plain, and he's saying, you've seen this. You've seen this. You might notice this. He keeps saying, you're witnesses. You're witnesses. He's just saying, look what's before your eyes. Look what's before your eyes. Look at what kind of leaders we are, right? And, and he's describing to them something they already are aware of. Like, if you don't know the background to the book of, of, of 1 Thessalonians, Paul is on a missionary journey. Uh, he's writing letters uh, to these churches that he visited. And when he first came to Thessalonica, he had come out of a place called Philippi. They got chased out of Philippi. They had been suffering. They were being persecuted. They were being chased. Mobs were trying to get together to stone them, kick them out of places. And so they come out of suffering, right, out of suffering into Thessalonica. And he's saying, remember how bold we were. Right? Godly leadership, radical leadership, the kind of leadership God is building with, the kind of leadership God wants you to aspire to, it's the kind of leadership that perseveres through trial and suffering, not like, you know, like barely hanging on, but in boldness. Right? And this isn't like Paul's great strength that fuels this. What fuels this is Paul's great confidence in God, which we're going to see as we keep going through. But he's saying, remember, remember who we are. And he also, you'll note, he says we a lot. He's talking about his, his leadership team, which includes a young guy named Timothy. All right? Paul's not like, hey, I, I, I. He's like, we, we, we. Godly leaders work together in team. One of my favorite quotes from a guy named uh, uh, Carl Harrington, a good, a good wonderful leader uh, in Confluence and had a massive influence on my life. He goes, he said in his like, kind of southern draw, he's like, Jesus didn't even send two, uh, one disciple to get a, a donkey. He sent two guys to get a donkey. And you're like, that's a good point, Carl. Like, you don't need two guys to get a donkey, but he sent a team. Uh, and here, Paul's like, you know who we are. He's like, remember, remember. And here's the thing. Like, actually, when they got to Thessalonica, they weren't there very long. And then they got kicked out of Thessalonica. And not only did Paul and his team suffer, but the church suffered. And the church endured. I want you to know something from the beginning here. One of the, the radical pieces uh, of who we are as a people is we are people who persevere through trial and we persevere through conflict. I've been a pastor for a long time, and I will tell you something that often is, is, is not great in the church, and that is I, I, I meet far more Christians who, who fold in conflict than I meet who persevere in conflict. I, it, like, I just want to encourage you and challenge you, especially relational conflict, right? You got a relational conflict in the church, what do you do? Do you deal with it? Do you, do you humble yourself? Do you say, hey, I might have sinned against you. Hey, let's work this out. Or do you just go to the church down the street because there's 20 options? Yeah. Right, what do most Christians do in American culture? They go to the other church, right? Uh, and sometimes there's not even a conflict. Sometimes, listen, sometimes Christians are like, well, they have an 8 a.m. service, and then I can watch the whole Chiefs game. And you're like, oh, gosh, Okay oh, you know, my kids, like, they really just, they have a better youth group. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, like it, it, it's interesting to me because Jesus is like, the world will know you by how you love one another, and we choose options and comfort over people and purpose. And here, like, like, that's like a level below what we're looking at here, right? And here we're looking at, like, persevering through conflict. Man, Christians are not great at this, right? We should be. Jesus suffered, and for the joy set before him, endured the cross. All right, Paul suffered and continued on. And he models this. And, and this isn't just something for leaders. This is like, right, it's not just radical Christ and radical leaders. It's, it's a radical community who we persevere through conflict. And there is, listen, there is a great reward for those who persevere. Right? Actually, what's, what's so interesting, in 1 Peter, um, uh, Peter uses this phrase. He says, the tested genuineness of your faith. I want you to think about this phrase. The tested genuineness of your faith. He says, it's more precious than gold. Right, if I were to come in here today, I don't know how many people are in this room, but say I, you know, I, brought, I brought like a little gold chest, like it's just a chest full of like gold coins, like you'd all be pretty dang excited, right? Like, oh man, he's going to give us gold? Like we get a little, like, like, that's, like gold's expensive, that's worth a lot, it's got a lot of value, right? Peter's like, hey, the tested genuineness of your faith is more precious than gold. There's no amount of money that can buy the work of God through the pressure or through the test of genuineness of the faith. And how do we get that? It's by we endure with God, trusting in God. It's okay to be weak, right? Weakness isn't, that, that's not, there are actually weakness is a requirement of enduring through conflict because you say, I, you know, I'm weak, Lord, but you are strong, right? Paul didn't develop this again because he's strong. He developed it because he has a confidence in God. And you know how you get confidence in God? 
You trust Jesus through conflict. You trust Jesus through, through trial. And what happens is he will get you through. And then what you realize is things that used to be mountains, things that used to make you think you're going to die, when you have had the tested genuineness of faith, right, when you receive this, what happens is things that used to be mountains that would stop you in your tracks, suddenly you just walk by and you're like, oh, whoa. Right? You become an enduring, tempered, tested Christian with the tested genuineness of faith as a gift from God. Right? And Paul manifests this. Paul reveals this as a leader. He goes on in verse 3. He says, Our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Again, Paul here is defining what radical leadership looks like. Radical leadership, it, it doesn't, you don't have to co coerce. You don't have to like twist people's arms. Listen, I'm making invitations. I don't know if you've heard of the parable of the seed sower, but that guy's not out there like down in the soil. He's out there casting out the seed, right? Trusting that as he haphazardly throws that seed, God will do the work, right? We don't have to twist people's arms. We have the gospel of God. And we're motivated to go out. And Paul here, he's saying to us, he's saying, hey, our, our appeal doesn't come from error. We're not wrong uh, about this. Like, actually, here's what's crazy. I don't know how much you know about Paul, uh, the early apostles, but essentially, here's the thing. They were all eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. They were all eyewitnesses, the early apostles, the early disciples, eyewitnesses. To, so Jesus was leading a movement, right? Think about this. I want you to do the math on this. He only did... We, we overlook this so often. He only did three years of public ministry. Took you longer to finish high school, right? <laughs> Jesus did three, like, you think about this? Like, he only did, he didn't even get it five years in. Didn't make a hat. Like, three years of public ministry done by Jesus. Not huge numbers. In fact, he had this nasty habit of scattering the crowds by telling them things they didn't want to hear, right? Calling them to a costly discipleship. Calling them to purpose outside of this world. Right? Calling them to, to, to seek first the kingdom. He said things like, if you try to find your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Amen. Crowds did not like that. And they'd scatter. Right? Three years of ministry with this awful habit of scattering the people coming to his meetings and his sermons. Uh, and, and then at the end, Acts tells us that after he had died and resurrected, even after the resurrection, there were 120 people gathered and praying. Right? That's not like... This is not like incredible numbers of people, right? And, and, and like, if you had a church of 120 people, people would be like, oh, you know, you probably need to get a leadership book or some kind of church multiply book. Like, that'll really help you out. Like, G Jesus, what's your kids' work look like? And he's like, what? <laughs> I just multiply fish. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. Uh, kids love that. Uh, and so, like, here's the thing. Like, three years of public ministry, uh, and, 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 and then he died, and he rose from the grave. And, and these guys are like, they, were, they, they had seen it, but Paul was interesting. Paul was unique. Because actually, he was an enemy of the resurrected Christ. He was like the number one enemy of the early Christian church. That's who he was. He was the number one enemy of the early Christian church. He had high standing. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees, he says. He had one of the greatest teachers. He had a great pedigree. He went to the right college, right? He had wealth. He had position. And he was known for his great zealousness for the law. And he got the special privilege to be like the guy punishing the church for all their blasphemy and all of their heresy. And so what he, what he spent his time doing was he spent his time arresting Christians and getting Christians locked away, getting Christians put to death. This is what Paul did. And one day while he's on his way to Damascus, the resurrected Christ showed up <laughs> and it changed Paul's life forever. So when he says, and the, the, the Thessalonians would have known this, when he says our appeal does not spring from error, he's saying, listen guys, if anyone should be believed, it's Paul. He gave up everything. Something cataclysmic happened in his life. I mean, not only did he give up everything, he hated the Christians. And what did God do after an encounter with Jesus? Completely transformed Paul. And this is the work of God. His appeal doesn't spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we've been approved by God and entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our heart. Listen, guys, I'm telling you this. The, the key here, the central idea here to being a radical people is knowing a radical Jesus, knowing that the power is in his hands, knowing that he is calling you like the Great Commission. Guess what? That belongs to you. 
right? The appeal to go out and make disciples, the appeal to tell people about who Jesus is, this belongs to you. And listen, our goal is not to get the approval of man. In fact, often the things that we say will get us rejected by men. And here Paul is saying our goal is not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. He says, we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. He didn't just come and tell them what they wanted to hear. He didn't just come in and say, hey, let, let, listen, you guys look great. This is all, like, he didn't just come. You'll find preachers today, leaders today, who just tell you what you want to hear. In fact, the kind of leader most people are looking for is someone who's distant, who can't see into your life, and someone who tells you what you already believe and makes you feel good about all the mistakes that you've made, <laughs> right? In the sense that they don't tell you their mistakes. They're like, no, you were right. You were justified. Most people are looking for that in our world. It's why the, the, this sort of, there's this rise of sort of a victim mindset philosophy happening in our world where you aren't wrong, you're a victim. Right? Actually, you're right and, and, and you have no help. Like what's funny is victimhood is a chain, right? It, it ties you to something that says, oh no, this is just who you are and you can't get away from it. But it gives you license to sort of be bitter about everything. It does not lead to life and goodness. Now, that's not to say we should acknowledge there are people who are victims of sin and victims of brokenness, but Jesus came to set the captives free, yeah. right. right? He comes to give hope and life. We didn't come with words of flattery, nor the pretext of greed, right? Like godly leaders, godly people, right? We're not in this for the money. I was a microbiologist before I was a pastor. I, I don't do this because I can make more money. I remember one time I was sharing the gospel with, uh, with some guys I used to work with, and there was this older gentleman named Ron Jackson, and he would, he'd always he'd jokingly he'd be like, oh, man the cloth, man the cloth. And, uh, and, you know, he just would berate me and say, you know, and I'm just like, keep telling him stuff, and I'm nice to him, and I don't, he strikes, I don't strike back. And I think that confused him a bit. Uh, and and he, uh, he, one day he goes, man, he goes, all you guys, all you preachers, you're just in it for the money. And I, I stop and I go, Ron, I go, we work together. I work, I'm a scientist. I don't get paid to preach the gospel. And it was like something in his brain broke, right? He just couldn't, he didn't have a comeback. And it wasn't long after that, that one day we're sitting at the desk and he says, Mike, he goes, this Sunday, he goes, I woke up, he goes, I put on my Sunday best. He goes, I was going to go to church. He goes, as I was walking towards the door, he said, he looked, he goes, I, I walked by this mirror, and, and I said, I looked at it, and I said, who do you think you are? Like, no, no they're going to say, why is Ron Jackson here? He, should, he doesn't belong here. He shouldn't be here. And he goes, and I went back, and I sat down, and I didn't go to church. And I was like, man, I said, Ron, I go, there might have been people who said that and thought that. And I said, but there's so many more people, and there's angels in heaven who would be celebrating that right. you showed up yeah, to right. seek Jesus. Yeah. And so he and I just began this new relationship. Like, he opened up. Like, this is like a hardened guy near retirement who, like, you know, doesn't have, like, blue-collar guy who, who's, like, his ideal is not to be, like, shepherded by a 24-year-old, very confident, you know, young scientist. Uh, who I was also his boss, like, at the time. And, <laughs> right? And, but we just began to have these deep spiritual conversations. And, and, and the difference, what, like, like, again, you know, just this idea of, like, man, it's, it's Christ-like. Jesus didn't come for what he could gain but rather he poured himself out. Right? He didn't just come and tell people what they wanted to hear, but rather he laid his life down. Paul is saying he led like that. Godly leaders will lead like this. Godly leaders will lead like this. Uh, Paul says this uh, in, uh, in, first, uh, or in Timothy. Here's what he says. I love this so much. He says, the aim of our charge, this is 1 Timothy 1, chapter 1, is the very first, one of the very first things he says to his young disciple Timothy. He says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about they make confident assertions. Right? We have a world full of guides and gurus who want to be the, the authority on this. They want to build their influence. They want to develop a following. And most of that following is from afar. It's not people who are in your life that you're, you're drawing to yourself. And, and I just think if you look at the Bible, it's like, man, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. What I love about this is he's not like the aim of our charge is a really good plan. Right? Ultimately, he's saying, hey, the aim of our charge is Christ-likeness, right? And the Beatitudes, I think that blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the pure in heart. 
you know, just all these things that you, like this is, he's saying the aim of our charge is a love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Aim of our charge is Christ-likeness. Right? And you see that here in our Thessalonians verse. This is what Paul is pointing us towards. Saying God is witness. Saying you have witnessed this. You have seen this. Right? If you look around, listen, godly leaders, I, I just think it's so important. Like you, you, you've got to understand the gift that it is to have leaders whose lives you can see into and leaders who can see into your life. It's not necessarily something you want to hear, right? And in a culture where that is like no one has that, we were talking about like counselors and therapy last night, and, and there's certainly like great bonus and benefit sometimes from going to counseling and going to therapy, but I have my, you know what my philosophy is? That those are meant to be things that happen while you're being pastored and shepherded in a local church. That actually those will be multiplied. The effectiveness of those things will be multiplied when you are getting pastored and shepherded. When you can see into the lives of those giving you advice, right? Another great confluence leader, Tim Chambers, one time, he said, he said uh, that, that you should be getting most of your leadership input from people whose lives you can see. And I thought, that is so wise. Yeah. And it's because it's Tim Chambers, you know, pastors in Joplin. And uh, just great man. But think about it. You should get most of your leadership input and advice from people whose lives you can see, right? Paul, is, you notice that. He said, your witnesses, your witnesses, your witnesses. You should be, you can see into the life of Dylan. You can see into Rebecca's life. You can meet their kids and talk to their kids, right? And you can hear, you can talk to Rebecca and find out how marriage is going, right? You can see it. It's usually pretty obvious, right? But you're living life together. That, that was like a mark of the New Testament church was life together, and not only was it a mark of the New Testament church, but, you know, like, do you know, right, we have, when we think about leadership in the culture, right, our, the idea is like, leaders are up here, and, and the people are down here, right, and there's sort of this separation, and the better leader you are, and the higher up you get, guess what happens? The more separate you get, the more you, you sit in different seats when you go to a baseball game, right, the more you get in a sit, sit in different seats when you get on an airplane, the more separated, the more privileges you have, the more you get served. What was the model Jesus gave us? The exact opposite. <gasps> yeah, right? Like, like God was up here and rightly deserved to be served, to be worshipped, right? Rightly deserves these things. And yet he emptied himself, yes. made himself a servant and came down to dwell among us, right? Godly leaders, listen, Christian brothers and sisters, beloved, it is so important because there's not just secular guides and gurus. There's Christian guides and gurus. There's a thousand million Christian podcasts, right? Like there's a thousand million online preachers who preach with such great power. All right, Paul says this. Let me, let me give you another one. This is from, this is from 1 Corinthians. He says, <clears throat> make sure I'm in the right chapter here. He says, for though, this is 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 17. He says, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, not my work associate, not the pastor of, of missions and church oversight, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. I love this, right? It says you have countless guides, but not many fathers. Good fathers, guess what? They live in the house. Good fathers, you see them. You interact with them regularly. We live in a culture with countless guides and gurus, even to Christ. But spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers are rare. Listen, Christian brothers and sisters, I'm going to wrap this up here. But here, here's my invitation to you, is that first and foremost, this is very simple. As you get to know Jesus, you get to know a radical love and a radical God. It's like, it's radical grace, right? That's the thing. It's radical grace. It's, it's in a culture where CEOs are at the top, moving farther and farther from the people, taking more and more from the people, getting paid the most, served the most. The God who had it all emptied himself to become a man, born like we are, walking like we are, suffering like we are, and yet was without sin. And he went to that cross and he endured our sin. He took the weight of our brokenness. He took the weight of all the sin you're going to commit. And guess what else he took? He took all the sin committed against you. That when you believe in him, not only are you forgiven, but you can be healed. You can be broken, made whole. You can go from death to life. And through that humility of saying, Lord, I believe these things, God does a real spiritual work in your life. 
And as you come to know Christ, listen, if this is all you get out of this, like go towards Jesus, run towards Jesus, you don't actually need much more instruction than that. Because when you know him, you become like him. When you know him, you see that love and you reflect that love and he, will tra- he transforms you. He does this work. He has the power to do the work. This morning at the Dream Team meeting, I was reading one of my favorite passages in the Bible, 1 Peter 1, and it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, not your work, not your status, not how you feel, according to his great mercy, he has caused you to be born again. Right? He has caused something in you. It's his power, it's his strength, and it's past tense when you believe in Christ. He caused it to happen once for all time. Hebrews 10, 14 says, it says, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time. Oh, Lord. Amen. For by a single offering, he has perfected you for all time. And I love it so much. And here's the thing. You know, Christ, this, this radical love, this radical message is transformative and changes you. The next thing we need to do is we need to be a radical community submitted to radical leaders who look like Jesus, who live like Jesus. We need to be a community seeking after Christ, living in a place where we can see the, the, the like, you know, I just want you to know it's a treasure. It's not an obligation, right? It's a treasure to exist in a kingdom community that's under Jesus and his radical grace and his radical love. It, it's, it's such a privilege for me. Like, I think about all the leaders I'm submitted to. It's so funny to me, this concept of submission, like it's kind of a, 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 a bad rap in our culture, but guess what? I'm a submitted man and I'm so thankful. Yes. Yeah. I'm so thankful I'm submitted. First of all, I'm so glad the buck doesn't start with me. It doesn't stop with me, you know? At my church, I'm the lead elder, but like, you know, here's the thing, I got people I can call, I got a God I can rely on, right? I'm submitted to Christ and I'm submitted to godly men all throughout our family of churches. I've got spiritual mothers who have guided me and shepherded me and helped me. Notice in this passage how Paul talks about spiritual fathering and spiritual mothering. These are so important. Be a community seeking after Christ, being like Christ, being shepherded by godly spiritual fathers, godly spiritual mothers that you can see in their lives and you let them see into your lives. Right? And as you persevere together and you cling together in Christ, God will do wonderful work in you. And finally, I want to encourage you guys to be people who aspire to this kind of leadership. The kind of leadership that, that models after Christ, that empties himself. I, that Paul took great cost, guys, he laid down so much. Some of you guys, like, you, you know, you've got so much around you. You've got so much around you, so much opportunity. And sometimes God calls us to do costly things for the kingdom, right? Uh, no matter what, he actually always calls us to something costly, right? It may not be financially, it may not be, but it, it, like, here's the thing, God's always calling us to something costly. And I wanna encourage you to be a people who walk joyously, joyously laying down their lives and serving like Christ. And this only comes, right, if you get the first thing right, the rest of it falls in order. And if you get this radical pursuit of a radically merciful and gracious God, if you get that right, everything else falls in place. But treasure godly leaders, treasure beautiful, wonderful kingdom community, and cling through conflict. Open up your lives and seek after all that God has for you. I'm going to pray for us and wrap us up here. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for your word. There really is so much here in these 16 verses of Thessalonians. And Father, I, I do, I just pray that you would build up King's Church in this word. Father, that, that, that you would stir a radical, fresh pursuit and love of Christ. God, that, that challenges us. Lord, I think about this. Every day I wake up, I'm challenged by the gospel of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and the love of Christ and the purpose of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ and the servant heart of Christ. And Lord, I pray that for this community. And Father, I pray this would be a community that values godly leadership, elders, spiritual fathers, Father, wonderful spiritual mothers, brothers and sisters that we walk alongside and we glean from. Well, we walk in the light, our lives visible to one another. And Father, I pray that you would make this an enduring community, a community that endures through conflict, a community that has open arms, that God endures in purpose and welcomes many in. And I pray if there's people here this morning saying, man, is this it? Or if there's people here and they've had church hurt, that Father, you would begin to heal their hearts and transform them. Well, I have been so hurt so many times. The world would tell me to guard my heart, but Lord, what I've done is I've trusted you. And while I've endured great pain, Father, I feel more capable of vulnerable love than I've ever felt because you give great reward to those who persevere. Father, I pray you do that work here at King's Church. 
Jesus, build your kingdom here. Draw hearts to you and raise up a godly community and godly leaders. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.